For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 3, Episode 23 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami. Our look at patient advocacy today starts now. This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. If you go to the entry of the Brussels Parliament, so you have a big hall, and the most planetary rooms are on the fourth floor, but we have just one track of elevators. There are eight elevators. And imagine the 700 politicians have to use those elevators. But also this 1,000 lobbyists are waiting for the right moment that in this elevator, your politician is jumping in. And then you have four floors time to convince your politician and to get his interest. The idea of 700 legislators and 1,000 lobbyists uh, sounds to me more like a rugby scrum than it does a uh, an organized event, but that, that's pretty cool. So it was actually the first time that I ever talked to a politician about liver disease after Achim somehow linked me. And actually, a healthcare politician from one of the major parties in Germany was all of a sudden interested in liver disease, and he would listen to me. And that was for sure a groundbreaker from my side. If I could do a 15-second fiber scan and a lift in four, it going up four floors, I would be absolutely Absolutely nailing it. <laughs> We've heard your offer to go to go um, fiber scan the House of Commons before. I'll do Brussels. You tell me. Ursula von der Leyen, Easel, Lancet Commission, second leading loss of work lives in Europe. It's, it's, it's a big problem. When you think about what we can do as advocacy organizations, it is all of those points. It's the connecting to clinicians. It is educating, raising awareness about NASH, but also patient empowerment and, all, and other stakeholder empowerment as well. Achim, I'm seeing you as the silo breaker here now because, again, as a clinician, I rarely talk to the obesity physicians. By now, we talk more with the diabetes patients or physicians. But uh, again, I'm, this is pretty siloed. A lot of that is in large part part of the, the NASH Council kind of umbrella. How can we bring together as many diverse voices as possible to talk about NASH? <laughs> A global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Professor Jarn Schottenberg, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, Global Liver Institute Vice President of Policy and Public Affairs Andrew Scott and German patient advocate Akeem Kautz as they discuss what it means to be a fatty liver patient advocate today, this week, on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. Для всіх, хто цікавиться мережею NASH або загалом жировою хворобою печінки, ловіть хвилю. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to thank, again, our friend Anna Kokar for doing such a nice job of translating our opening line into Ukrainian so that I don't have to mangle pronunciation on a word-by-word -word basis. And as with previous weeks and future weeks, our thoughts and our hopes and our prayers are with the people of the Ukraine as they deal with this horrible situation in which they find themselves. So first of all, by the time you're listening to this, I will be in the air over the Atlantic on my way to Barcelona for the Innovations in Natural Care Congress on Thursday, where I will actually meet in person for the first time Louise and Jorn. And Achim as well. But um, Achim, we don't know each other nearly as well by video as I know Louise and, and you and I probably spent as many hours a week talking to Louise as anybody else on the planet except my wife. And we've been doing this for two years. We've never been face to face in the same place. And Andrew, Louise has never met Donna face to face. And they spend a lot of time talking to. Actually, Jorn, have you ever met Donna face to face? Yeah, ASLD. I don't think we've had extensive exchange, but for sure. So it, it promises to be uh, quite a week for all of us. And um, you'll be listening to this and we'll all be flying to Barcelona. We'll have more details on that in the business report. And then it'll be next week's episode. This week's episode, though, is something I'm really excited about. We are going to be talking about the role of patient advocate today. We have with us uh, Andrew Scott, who our listeners know well. I guess, what, Andrew, fourth time you've been with us? Fifth time, something like that? Yeah, it's been a few. Excited every time, though. 
it's good every time. People like it when you come on this podcast. So we're happy to have you back. We'd be happy to have you back anyway, but they like it and that doesn't hurt. And then we have Achim Kautz with us. Achim, this is your first time on podcast, right? Yeah, that's okay. right. And before we say hi to Louise and Jorn and kick off the conversation, do, do our listeners a favor, take a couple of minutes and tell them about yourself and your history, your experience, what you do, how you got to doing this for a living, what you like best about it. And then at the end, one thing our audience would not know if you did not tell them. Your competition includes things like professional athletes, recording music, Musicians and um, a Neil Henderson story about a talent show in med school that I can't repeat because it's only marginally G-rated. So, um, so but, but you, you've got tough competition. At any rate, Achim, floor is yours. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. I hope I fulfill all the expectations. Yeah, well, my name is Achim Kautz. I'm from Germany. I'm a patient advocate now for more than two decades in the field of liver disease. I was a former CEO of the German Liver Health Association. I has helped up to create a European umbrella organization, ELPA, European Liver Patient Association a uh, long time ago. I was active in creating the World Hepatitis Alliance. I was co-responsible at least for five WHO resolutions. And yeah, so my core purpose really is to listen to patients, patients' demands, and translate this to doctors, scientists, and politicians. And that is what I'm focusing here. And now to beat what is the secret of my former professional life, I was for more than 10 years a professional circus artist. So juggling, walking on a rope, acrobatic, artistic. And I guess it helps a lot because doing patient advocacy, you need to juggle and to hold all the possibilities in your hands up to five balls at the same time. It's not a problem for me. And maybe that is a point why I've managed all these things in the past. Uh, so in your circus career, were you a juggler? What, what, what circus skills did you perform? Um, I do all the things with equiballistic, means I hold balance on a rope, on a roller roller, a roll bread, a roll bread, juggling, balancing, doing a lot of fire performances, a lot of clones things, and a lot of acrobatic, partner acrobatic things. And I did it professional. I had a management in Berlin, and I traveled around more or less 10 years with events throughout Europe and make big shows, uh, not on the stages, but also to well, that certainly puts you in the uh, medal round of our best ever. I, I, can't, I can't say it's a clear win. At some point, Louise, we're going to have to take the ones we like best to have a competition and have listeners tell us who wins. Then we'll have to decide what the prize is. Absolutely. I'm going to bring a load of livers for him to juggle in Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can ring. <laughs> so I can do, yeah, stand-up performance. Still, I try to do still these exercises, keep a little bit young, but in former times, so it was really around eight hours training per day. But then after 10 years, your body is ruined because of accidents. And then nowadays, so I try to do a one hour a day. So keep juggling and balancing. And, and from there, you came to liver advocacy. Andrew, let me turn to you for a second. Give me what you think is the best metaphor combining Achim's two careers, circus performing and Achim, let's, say, let's let Andrew do this one. What do you think is the best metaphor? You know, that is a good question. And I'll say something about joy and the joy that you would bring your audience watching you, your also bringing to patient advocates, you know, as we try to improve their lives and, and change policies and more. I mean, maybe something, something about that connection there. I'm trying to think of a good good metaphor to kind of, uh, you know, draw the through line. But yeah. Andrew, that's really brilliant because I'm sure I'm not alone in going to things like Achim went to, like how many things can you juggle at once? How strong is your core? When you're on a unicycle and somebody blows the wrong way, how do you stay up when the world is trying to knock you over? I, I would never have gone to anything that uplifting. I, we all all know why you are so good at what you do and such great guests when you come on here. That was fantastic. Maybe one one key learning is um, so I was used to entertain people and I was used to translate simple things into a story. And I think that's very helpful for being a patient advocate. So because you need to go to politicians, you need to make them understandable what is the issue. And that is something, so once you have learned this in a professional way, and by the way, I'm also a scientist for communication. So this was my second short career. So I think I can combine it and use it best for uh, yeah, doing advocacy work for patients. The wise guy in me wants to ask you how many scientific textbooks you ever juggled at once, but I'm going to skip that question and we'll just go to a groundbreaker end of the conversation. Simple groundbreaker, one good thing, personal or professional, that's happened in the last week in your life. Brave one, go first. Uh, very simple. I can start my daughter's birthday. So she is now 11 and we had a very nice day. And um, so that is something. So I have three kids. 
And therefore, those days are the highlight days. I'll go next. My husband and I support a charity called Shooting Stars Children's Hospice. And we donated um, money and bought a private viewing in one of the major cinemas in London. So we re-premiered Four Weddings and a Funeral yesterday for about 100 friends and family in support of Shooting Stars Children's Hospice. So it was a lovely day. And it's personal to us because we sort of spoofed our wedding based on this film. So it was a bit of entertainment. Some people had seen it some people hadn't and everybody giggled and moaned and groaned in the right places so it's just a great movie and it was a bit of fun for charity it's a fantastic movie great choice very interesting okay go ahead andrew yorn yeah so i'm actually in business school at night and my quarter just ended last week so part way through uh you know finished up a class or multiple classes and now i've got a little break for at least a week and a half before a new set of classes starts so that's always nice to kind of get it get something done there and uh, that felt good you yeah to follow up professionally, I guess. I just got back from a meeting in Vienna last week. And over the weekend, we had the German internal medicine meeting here. Big thing, all different societies getting together. And it was fun to be able to give a talk on fatty liver, fibrosing liver disease. Um, That was a professional highlight for me. I guess the second thing is, and Achim, I didn't know your birthday, uh, the birthday of your daughter. It's it's actually the birthday of my daughter today too. So uh, it's kind of an incident. And uh, and that's, of course, a personal highlight. And And I'm trailing behind some years. Uh, as you know. Yeah. So I guess my professional highlight is 15 minutes or a half hour after we stop recording this session, we will start recording the first session of our endocrinology pilot that I've been talking about on the podcast for about a month. It now actually has a title. The title is Nash Tsunami in Diabetes, and the subtitle is Getting Ahead of the Rising Tide. As you can see, there's a common theme here, and in fact, common phrase, Nash Tsunami. Ken Cousy is my co-host for that, and today's episode will feature Stephen, Harrison, and Ken and Kathleen Corey from Harvard and Kay Pepin from the Mayo Clinic talking about things we've learned in the last couple of years that might encourage endocrinologists and others who care about diabetes to take a second look at how much they want to integrate NASH into their practices. It'll be a four episode pilot series. If it goes well, we're hoping to continue it month after month and really excited about this. We've been working towards this for a long, long time. So that would be the professional, the personal. Gosh, I'm older than you guys. Uh, We went to my wife's godson's 40th birthday party this weekend in Washington. D.C. A little more than 11 and certainly a lot more than Jorn is talking about. While there, I also had a really fantastic experience. We live on a tiny spit of land. We have the Delaware River, which is one of America's historic rivers on one side, and we have a path for what used to be a canal that in the 19th century was used to carry uh, goods and products from other parts of Pennsylvania and Ohio down to Philadelphia or from south up to New York, and we run between the two. Uh, My wife and I went for a jog this weekend on the uh, Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Path in D.C., which is basically the same thing. On the one side, you have the Potomac River, and on the other side, you have the canal path. And I'd never done that anywhere else before. It's it's a great run, and we've now decided we've got to figure out where else in the States we can find a way to replicate that. Oh, and to start each run, you have to run across the bridge into a different state. So we ran from Arlington into D.C., and then at home, we ran from Pennsylvania into New Jersey. So that was just a great experience. We're going to find out how many other states we get to do that in. And with that, why don't we get started? I think you've kind of dove into this a little bit already, but questions first to to Andrew and to Achim. I've got four of them. How you define your mission? How you came to work in NAFLD and NASH? Achim, I'm I'm fascinated to hear the transition from circus. Certainly, I think Andrew, yours is a little simpler. And then what do you consider the three most important elements of your work? Let's let's stop there. There's a fourth question, but we'll come back to that after those three. Um, Brave one, go first. Okay, so just two minutes, uh, not two hours. (laughs) Okay. Um, um, well, as I said, I was the CEO of the German Liver Health Association, and I was confronted right at the beginning years with the fact that we had a big proportion of obese people who suffer from liver disease. And it was that at that time, it was around 2002, so there were simply no answer from scientists and others. So, and I think that is something so that has continued over time. And what has really started was a section that it was around 10 years. I was still responsible at the time for liver cancer patient face-to-face consultancy. And I was confronted first time with a patient who suffered from liver cancer because he had NASH. And that was something so, wow, maybe we had forgotten something to communicate. And at that time, we started to work in 
the field more concentrated on the field of Navid Nash. Yeah, this is uh, how I started now this journey now for 12 years and I've learned a lot and going to the project, I think it would be first interesting, Andrew, if you can tell me your background and your motivation and your mission. Yeah, so I mean, that's very, you know, I will say the liver for me has become a passion, but it was not always what defined my my kind of career. I, I've always worked in, in public health and health policy. I, I studied public health for my degree and then also worked in government affairs for a pharmaceutical company and then as a consultant representing a variety of different medical device and oncology industry companies. And, and then I finally ended up at GLI. And really what drew me to GLI was our mission, which is essentially to elevate liver health policy to what we believe is its rightful place on the on the global public health agenda based on its prevalence and impact. What is so critical is that during my other roles, you know, sitting on the other side of the table, so to speak, the industry side, and then shifting to the patient advocacy side, you really learn the value of advocacy. You know, advocacy is the action that really supports the implementation of policies. And patient voice is so critical in that. So when we look at our organization and the role that we play, you know, outside of that kind of high level mission, how can we, you know, as I mentioned, you know, how can we elevate the patient voice and get patients a seat at the table so that they can tell their story and influence change. Uh, and that is also what has kind of led to our organization really prioritizing NASH and NAFLD is because many of those patients were not given any seat at the table for so long. And we thought this was an unmet need, not only in treatment and care, but also in policy. And that's where we thought we could come in and provide a valuable tool to get a seat at the table to hopefully shift change and lead to a more of a conversation. And I've been excited to use my experience on that industry government affairs lobbying side to kind of provide some tools to our advocacy efforts and to hopefully kind of be action oriented and really kind of shift change and collaborate, right? Collaborate with our partners in the EU and more. I mean, we can't do this alone and no voice is, is powerful enough alone. So we need to all come to the table together, work together. And it's about elevating patients as part of that. And, and it's been a great uh, experience experience so far. And I think every year we've talked about this in past years, but it's been great to see every year the Nash policy movement continue to pick up steam. Yeah. And maybe I can jump in here, Andrew, because I think you mentioned one very interesting thing. I think we from the patient advocacy side, we have one big advantage. We have experience. Well, we have managed, I think, a fantastic journey in hepatitis C. So and all the learnings over these years from specific for hepatitis C, we can transfer it now to the Nash policy policy advocacy work. And I think what you said is absolutely right. Addressing the issues to politicians or to stakeholders who are able to change the landscape, we need to create one voice. And we need to create it in a way that those people understand really the needs and the circumstances of those who are affected or at high risk to have Nafit Nash. And I guess that is the main work currently we all doing. And things that going on here in Europe, for example, is um, we have worked together with ESA on a patient lay version of a patient guideline and you are part of this. I think this is a very successful element now because advocacy is a mixture of tool and tactics. So we have now a more proper tool we can use over Europe but also globally if we extend. And the other thing is I think that is something so we have some specific setting in some countries to bring the different disciplines who are working with NASH patients from the scientific point of view, bring them together and I think so what we have achieved now here in my country last year was the first ever statement from all the different disciplines to our government saying, hey, hello, we need some NASH actions. And it was great because it was that we had the first time that the field of hepatology has widened up to the whole diabetic field, the whole cardio field, but also to others, nutrition, etc., public health. And I think creating this voice 
from the scientific point of view, but also from the patient point of view, and then the alignment to go out with one message. That is the work we should do for this year to address things in a way that we can work on a specific agenda. Let me just dive in here. I think it's very true. I mean, Achim brings a lot of positive energy to the table. And I think that now that I know about his previous life, I know where in parts uh, it came from and where he trained it from. So it was actually the first time that I ever talked to a politician about liver disease after Achim somehow linked me and uh, it might have been not directly, but it could have been indirectly. And actually a healthcare politician from one of the major parties in Germany was all of a sudden interested in liver disease and he would listen to me. And that was for sure a groundbreaker from my side. So I'll bite. I might not have been too aware what uh, patient health organizations were doing. You know, you'd think, okay, they help the patient to find the right doctor or answer the questions what the doctor did or did not say and, and why they were out of the room again after five minutes or something. No, I mean, the, the whole concept of linking science and, and knowledge to publicly available bodies and in particular in Germany, um, politicians and, and um, policymakers, um, that was for me really the eye-opening experience here. And, and, and really, uh, thank you, uh, Achim. I think this was a special experience. And, and that's really so true, though, is when you think about what we can do as advocacy organizations, it is all of those points. It's the connecting to clinicians. It is educating, raising awareness about NASH, but also patient empowerment and all, and other stakeholder empowerment as well. I mean, many times, you know, the point that you just mentioned about policymakers being surprised that they'd be interested in liver or being blown away by that. If we empower patients and help them understand that policymakers want to hear from the liver advocacy community and they're willing to change or change policies that improve the lives of those impacted by liver disease. We just have to kind of get a seat at the table, and that's where we can really help as advocacy organizations uh, through, through the empowerment of patients and other stakeholders. So let me ask both of you a question about something I believe is the difference between the countries. I may be naive from either direction on this, but my sense is that the European countries that tend to organize in a more parliamentary or kind of way, Germany less so than some, but still, you know, you weren't talking about someone in a, a politician who was interested in health policy. My sense is there, the parties designate people to own that portfolio. Whereas in the States, uh, my sense is it's kind of a free-for-all. People pick and choose their own issues. Parties don't tell, uh, don't particularly tell. I mean, you have the committee system to some degree, but beyond that, advocacy is much more of a catch-as-catch-can kind of thing. Is that accurate? Or, and if no, what am I missing? And if yes, what challenges does that impose? I mean, I'll say first from the state side, you're right. And also it's not exactly that way though. I mean, the committee aspect definitely guides policymakers in the issues they care about. You know, if they sit on energy and commerce committee in the House of Representatives and they're part of the health subcommittee, that will naturally guide them to care or prioritize health issues. But at the same time, legislators sometimes come into office with issues that they really care about. And that's where even if they're maybe not on the relevant committee, there are still opportunities there and ways to work with these offices and ways for them to champion liver health. I mean, there are the caucuses as well that sometimes get to these priorities that are not based on committees. And these are kind of loosely formed collaborative agreements between members of Congress into caucuses that prioritize a specific issue that present opportunities for legislators that are not on the committee that will would allow them to focus on that issue. So there's a few different angles. They're guided in certain ways. I don't think the party ever tells a legislator to focus on something, but the way the, the system is, they do end up kind of falling into categories. Yeah, and thank you for this, Andrew. And I think so Europe and Europe is special and different because of all the different countries and all the different healthcare systems and but also legislative system. When it comes, let me focus on Europe. I think that is more interesting because it affects more countries than just my home country, as you know, and have mentioned one of the examples. I think one of the things really is um, it's a mixture of defining a long-term strategy, being loud, being noisy as a patient, so, and use all opportunities to bring in, so, hey, here we have a problem. But on the other hand, the learning really is how to approach best to politicians is not to say, hey, we have a problem, but to go to him and say, we have solutions and you are able 
to take care of the solutions. And within that bigger system, so you need to pick out this politician who is able to do a, a simple, tiny change and then see the advantage because he has invested his name, he has invested his time, his power. And I think that's the most promising way. And this is something so we need to analyze first before we start policy, really, okay, what can be changed on the legislative side, by whom, and how many steps it is needed from a person or a group of persons to change this. And then you need to go first to the low-hanging fruits so that politicians can really say, hey, I have taken over the issue of mesh and I have just spoke to that person and now I'm uh, the, the big one who is in the spotlight of social media, etc. So this is an encouraging element to go to the next politician to say, hey, your colleague has done that and you can do that. And that is more a kind of defining the road. And I think the learning here really is that we from the patient advocacy but also from a scientific committee, we had learned over years not to complain, but to work on solutions. And it's like a puzzle to set the right politician to the right piece of the puzzle and put that together and go a road along the years. That is how policy works. And maybe I'll give you a very funny story. We have in Brussels, the EU parliament, we have the so-called four elevator pitch. I don't know if you heard this. If you go to the entry of the Brussels parliament, so you have a big hall and the most planetary rooms are on the fourth floor, but we have just one track of elevators. There are eight elevators. And imagine this 700 politicians have to use those elevators. But also this 1,000 lobbyists are waiting for the right moment that in this elevator, your politician is jumping in. And then you have four floors time to convince your politician and to get his interest. I think one of the things that mostly works is really to be well informed about private things of these politicians and bring in small but fancy and remaining aspect you tell them in this elevator. So means you have 10 to 15 seconds and then, okay, have you ever asked you this question? Here's my card. And not bring in the topic, well, we have so many patients, blah, 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 blah. That's not working. So, but this way is very promising. So to have a more long-term attention. You know, I'll only add really quickly because that is a, a great story. And I'll say it makes me think while there is a lot of differences between how the U.S. government operates and then obviously uh, governments all across Europe operate, there are also a lot of similarities, too, because that story, uh, interestingly enough, lines up very much with how things are handled here in Washington. And as a little kind of tidbit, which I think this story has been proven untrue over the years, but it has carried a lot of weight for a long time. And that is that the Willard Hotel here in downtown Washington, D.C., very old hotel, was always known as the hotel where lobbying got its name because the lobbyists would wait in the lobby of the hotel for members of Congress that come down or they leave the restaurant and they do that same type of elevator pitch in the lobby of the Willard Hotel. And that is something that I think carries so much weight and it ties very much into how, you know, as I mentioned earlier, ways that we can help patients tell their story and ways that we can help them understand, okay, what are the key tidbits? Um, and if it's in the U.S., you know that a member of Congress is on a relevant committee or caucus or from a relevant state, but you can adjust your pitch or your story in such a way, not changing it in any way, of course, but highlighting pieces that might lead to their attention and then create that opportunity in the future, as Ahi mentioned. So I think that is, you know, there's a lot of through lines there. Even if some of the, the aspects behind the scenes are different, there are opportunities with advocacy. And I think that underlines, again, why collaboration globally is so important. So it's funny because, you know, you hear the phrase elevator pitch in sales and marketing as the ultimate thing to have to do. If you have 30 seconds in an elevator, what could you get done? But Achim, two things. Number one is I've never heard the story told quite as uh, visually as you just told it. The idea of 700 legislators and a thousand lobbyists uh, sounds to me more like a rugby scrum than it does a uh, an organized event, but that, that's pretty cool. And second, the idea that what you're describing isn't really pitching the issue, it's piquing the interest of the individual. It is, yes. So because this is something, so you need to look at in a, in a bigger framework. So in health policy, normally you have tendencies of discussions. And one thing politicians hate is the story about, okay, if we do action now, we have savings in 10 years, because these politicians are not re-elected five times again. So he wants to have solutions within his 
period. And therefore, I think that the most promising part is really to focus on an outcome. So where this politician can see, okay, my energy has been used in a wise way. So the outcome I can use to be re-elected by telling the, uh, yeah, my, my people and my folk, so what I've done. I think that is one thing. And this is one thing, Andrew, I might I have a question to you. Things is that in Europe, we, I guess in, in, in general, scientists, like you, you're, you generate a lot of evidence, but it's more on the scientific way and so how this microbiome is working with this interaction and but also what is the outcome of some interventions. And I think what is needed is an alignment to creating evidence from the patient side. And I think that is something that needs to be done very complementary and therefore I'm very happy and that you join our project with our thousand patients to ask them about their attitudes toward nothingness, their knowledge, their social behavior around this. So to have it in a complementary style. So they have it, the scientific evidence, but also the patient evidence. And I guess Andrew, the same tactic works in the US as well, right? Yes, exactly. And I think you, you may have mentioned this a little bit earlier as well, but you know we did an advocacy day a few weeks ago with the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases here in the US, virtually on Capitol Hill. And the idea was, could we partner a patient with a clinician and then have the clinician provide the clinical data for legislators and then the patient to provide the lived experiences and to hit that side to kind of do those dual aspects that you're talking about. And I think that's where, you know, our organizations partnering and then working with Easel and ASLD and others as well is so critical to kind of show that groundswell movement. And then having all of our names there, all of our organizations with our own logos is valuable when you're dealing with legislators because it shows that it's not a single voice or a single person making a point, uh, a single organization. So I think that is is great to hear. So, Andrew, you kind of teed up one of the questions that I've got on my list for both of you, which is keeping in mind about 40 percent, 45 percent of this audience are folks working in pharmaceutical companies and another 20 or 25 are working in diagnostic companies or advising them regularly. So these are folks who are the, benef- who are the beneficiaries of your efforts, although they are not necessarily the folks you work with directly. Can, can each of you uh, tell Tell a story about something you've done recently that you think has been a success so that they can get a flavor for what it is specifically, you know, what's a win for you guys, for each of you guys. And then I'll have a couple more questions as we go along, but start there. Yeah. Okay. Well, just a tiny, small thing. So, so this is something you and we are organizing currently together. So we bring the patient groups of the field of diabetes, of adiposity, obesity, and other disciplines together to align the voice of those who are affected or in contact with at-risk patients or with patients itself. I think that is a small story. But let me tell you one principal thing with the industry. I think so we all play a part. And so I'm now working for more than two decades and I have seen so many people from industry coming in, jumping out and because of pipeline, etc. What is absolutely important really is that you need to be open for any communication. And what I do, and I think that is something that should ever everyone do is to have regular calls with all players in the field, not only the other patient organizations, not only the scientific organizations, but also with the industry, but also to encourage the industry not to think in silo. What I like them really is to come together and also to define together with the patients, with the scientific communities, with influencers, with others, one big work stream. And then in the end, everyone can be divided up with his professional way, but to define the same goal. I think that is the most important thing. And I think those companies who try to work in isolation um, will not succeed. This is very interesting. And, and I think maybe, uh, Achim, I'm seeing you as the silo breaker here now. Because again, as a clinician, I do get sent the patient for suspected liver disease, not for being obese, not for being diabetic, not for being at risk of liver disease, but for the tests are abnormal, you go figure it out. And I rarely talk to the obesity physicians. By now, we talk more with the diabetes patients or physicians. But uh, again, I, this is pretty siloed. And I know Louise has uh, something to say to that because we've discussed the silos in, in healthcare. And really looping them together through the patient advocacy is, is something that has been, from my perspective, 
a very um, successful way to moving the field forward. So, Louise, uh, given that you just got your lead in from Jorn, go ahead, comment, question, whatever you'd like to bring right now, and then we'll go back to Andrew in a couple of minutes for his success story. I've just been enjoying listening to the great work these guys do. And I think Jorn's right. Obviously, I've spent 35 years plus in healthcare, all of most of that in liver disease or psychiatry. And for me, it's and the reason I now talk about liver wellness and do towers on health is to prevent people becoming patients. I would like to see one day that advocacy is redundant because for to be in advocacy, we means we have an illness that we need to address that was never addressed up front and recognised as a future problem. And what we do have here is one of the biggest current past and future problems all rolled into one little ball called the liver. When I was listening to Akim earlier on, it, it was like, it's invisible and we need the magician to come out and bring it out to the fore. But this is the greatest showman, because if we can get everybody to acknowledge the role that liver plays within their diseases, we really will have the greatest show and we'll have solved or started to resolve those problems. But I still see a lot of people who are never going to be told they're a patient, but have poor liver health. And this is the underlying iceberg, because advocacy is about the ones who have been discovered as patients. The majority of people have poor liver health they're not necessarily ever going to get that opportunity and being in healthcare uh, with Jean and that we only ever see as he's referred to the ones who have sick livers or the ones who get the one percent of the one percent who had the bad test that somebody picked up I saw somebody last week full-blown cirrhosis normal liver function not uncommon as we all know but it is that marrying of everything together people have also alluded to the fact that politicians are only interested in their term they want immediate response and results. The liver is something that is so slow to change, to to develop disease, but yet it can be very quick to start to recover. So I think there are mass opportunities for the advocacy programs doing the work that they're doing to see those changes very quickly. I can monitor people's liver health improvements in weeks, not months, not years, but weeks particularly with fatty liver, particularly with weight management, weight loss, obesity management, quality of diet. We can now use all of these tools. If I could do a 15 second fiber scan and a lift in four, it going up four floors, I would be absolutely nailing it. <laughs> We've heard your offer to go to go um, fiber scan the House of Commons before. I'll do Brussels. You tell me. Ursula von der Leyen, Easel, Lancet Commission. Second leading loss of work lives in Europe. It's, it's, it's a big problem. I'm happy. I'll fiber scan anyway. <laughs> Andrew, the point Louise makes, right, is that you're not only advocating for the known sick, but also the unknown sick or, or those on the path to being a lot sicker. Um, my sense of GLI has always been that that's in focus for you folks. But I'd like you to talk about how you make that work. Yeah. So, I mean, I will say it's a delicate balance and an ongoing challenge. You know, I think to Louise's points... You know, outside of thinking of who is not sick and is going to be sick, you also need to think of the the burden on patients anyways to be advocates. So you have to find a way to lower the barrier of entry to make it easily accessible so that those that we don't need the the healthiest and the most able and the most resource you know heavy of advocates we can have ways for as many diverse people as possible to participate so that is a challenge just from those with a liver condition already. But then when you think about how to paint the picture and think of those that are incoming, it is a challenge because you don't necessarily want to overwhelm politicians either. And it's about painting a complete accurate picture of the problem while also making it attainable. To Ahim's point, the low hanging fruit is a critical piece of thinking of, okay, here's something we can do today. It is going to be a huge problem. We know that NASH will be the leading reason for liver transplant by 2030, but hitting too many of those far out points could scare off legislators. It's it's that delicate balance in how we can do that. And I will say one of our, our programs, our Advanced Advocacy Academy, tries to kind of balance this by lowering the barrier of entry for patient advocates, but then also giving them the tools so that they can go educate others outside of just policymakers and prepare them as well to start thinking of how can I talk to the general public? How can I talk to my family and more about what they're experiencing? So it's definitely an ongoing challenge. But I did want to mention one other thing too, because I think, you know, we were talking about this just a moment ago, that pain that 
picture of liver health across the continuum. And that is so great to hear, you know, I mentioned and others as well. It's something that we're, we're very much interested in also. And we just recently, I think this leads into my answer for the question as well. Just a few weeks ago, we launched our liver health is public health initiative. And that is something that while not NASH specific, the idea is, can we talk about liver health across a continuum. We know the main challenges, stigma, lack of awareness are felt throughout all liver conditions, but can we break down those silos, whether we're talking about medical specialties or talking about other stakeholders outside of their of the clinical side of things. We're talking about policymakers, we're talking about payers, we're talking about industry. How can we bring everyone together to think of liver health across a continuum? And that's, you know, we're very excited to launch that initiative and partner with many. And we're looking to always partner with more to really ensure that we we paint that complete picture. But I just want to mention it's, it's exciting to hear that we're always talking about that because that is always going to be an ongoing challenge of how can we really think of health consistently outside of the pure silos. Can I jump in here and to challenge one point? Um, I know I don't make friends now but when we talk about muffled nash i would state currently we do not have a community we have community representatives but not a proper community and i think that is something louis i like to come back to what you do but also you and to your thing i think one of the things i have learned over years doing advocacy on different levels national european global level and i guess we were very successful with the issues. We need to create patient community. My question to you, Luis, you have a patient and you have successful, good intervention. So how do you use this guy to advertise to the next person, to the next patient, hey, there is a simple solution for you. So because you come in from a country of peer-to-peer -peer experience, and I think that is working a lot of good examples in your country, but this has not been used in Merfeld Nash currently. And the same here in Germany. So how we, the physician currently connect one patient to the next patient telling success stories that is not done currently. And I think what we need to build up, Andrew, and I guess you agree, is really a Nash community. And for me, it's a Nash community, those who are affected with NASH, but we need to consider that 70% of our NASH population have comorbidities. So means the NASH community is a mixture of liver community, diabetes community, adipositas, obesity community. And that is something new. We need to learn. And I think now we can change a little bit the landscape towards that we have a patient voice for advocacy by creating a complete new community, a kind of interdisciplinary community. And I guess especially the role of you physicians to bring good best of practice examples together and have a peer-to-peer -peer advertising project rolling out, you can create community. And the other thing I also like to challenge here is what is about the GPs? So because if we go to the discussion liver healthy life and early primary prevention, so then we need to have the GPs. I'm very thankful that because we have now the patient guideline, I was invited now in June to the European GP conference to talk about NASH and I think that has a big reach now to the GP community in Europe. But I think that is challenging in a lot of parts of the world. I don't know, Andrew, how the situation is. Yes, bring in these two challenges that we have to do a lot of work. No, I, I absolutely think you're right. There is no overall community. And it's interesting. If I get to a patient side of how do you get that peer-to-peer -peer working, I think hepatitis C, for example, do it really, really well in the peer-to-peer -peer advocacy groups and at their community and how somebody helps somebody lead and is that source of contact. That can be done very well, but I actually see it stronger in the population who are not patients. They are people who choose to have fibre scan to know their liver health and well-being to offer the prevention and their psychology is totally different. Oh, so I've got high liver fat. Why would I not want to know? And what I tend to see, if you get a group of people, they then go out and compete against each other's scores and they make tweak slight tweaks to their diet their lifestyle and then they compete against each other there is something amazingly competitive about people who can't compete on a blood parameter but it is that brief intervention it is how do you motivate that and if you get groups it's easier but don't make them patients there is a different psychology there is a lot done about a patient role i did a set of scanning just briefly recently which was a long waiting list for an nhs of all of the people we 
discharged, 83% had high liver fat. They did not have fibrosis. So if I had not had cap on my machine, even liver physicians and it, who are, only have kilopascals miss NAFLD. We only are there for the NASH. So that was 83% of a population we would have known nothing about and who would have been discharged and will be discharged who would have had no intervention whatsoever. That's NAFLD. That is a population who will, as you were describing, will probably be endocrine cardiology. But we've already missed an opportunity because we don't have technology with CAP in most units. So we're not even looking after the livers that we know. We're only looking after fibrosis, which is, comes back to Jean's point about silo. If we can't use technology and non-invasive, blood tests don't tell us. We are not able to design or develop that strong community. You're right, that's where we have to start because a lot of people are a community. They just need to be told their part and be part of that drive. Everybody has the right to know their liver health. Everybody has the right to avoid diabetes, heart disease, liver disease and all of the plethora of diseases and conditions that are related. So it's really, really important to start breaking down these silos. And just a quick comment from my side, I think I don't really have an angle, at least from my side, to um, uh, foster interpatient interactions. I can, if somebody walks in my door, I can't tell them the results of the previous guy that just walked out. And, uh, you know, I can say, you know, historically, I know this worked for someone, but this is pretty abstract. So as a physician, I think this is even, you know, how do I pull these people together? That That's probably easy, not easy for me. So, Jorn, what I was going to note is that when I think of who works on this problem or this issue most assiduously and effectively, I think about some of the things that GLI does. So um, I know, Andrew, can you share things that GLI is doing aimed at fostering cross-communication, breaking down silo, uh, getting different specialties and different patient groups, and uh, for example, to integrate and interact more effectively? Yes, yeah. And I think a lot of that is in large part part of the, the Nash Council kind of umbrella. How can we bring together as many diverse voices as possible to talk about NASH. And I think that has led to a lot of valuable outcomes, like our language of NASH document that is kind of trying to get everyone to refer to the same data points, the same terminology when we talk about the condition, kind of level set the community. And we're talking about outside of just purely liver as well. Uh, you know, we're thinking of the diabetes angle, the obesity angle, the cardiovascular angle, and really trying to think of every player and ensuring they have a seat at the table in the NASH Council. But I will also mention as well, to Luis's point about technology, I think a lot of that is falling within our, our Beyond the Biopsy initiative, which I think I've mentioned on other podcasts cast as well. But again, if we can think of lessening the burden, just like when we're thinking of advocates and patient advocates, lowering that barrier of entry, thinking of generally uh, of GPs and, and primary care providers, how can we make it easier on them and showing them that it's actually very easy to diagnose liver health. It's very easy to have a conversation and easier to have that conversation earlier than later. So that initiative really, when we're thinking of that, how we can educate providers across different specialties, that's really been one of the goals of that initiative that we look forward to kind of continuing ramping up forward and partnering with others on that as well. Yeah, and I'd like to add this here. So um, so one tool I'm, I'm running is a very simple self-assessment for having a risk of having a liver disease. It's a simple questionnaire. It's a liver test in BE. And so we're not doing a lot of advertising because we try to generate data. Currently, we have around 360,000 participants so this year, and it, it seems that there is interest. So, and interestingly, is the self-assessment factor of people who might be at risk. When we had made some research, so, and coming to your point, Luis, so we have pre-selected groups who are very empowered to be in a good health, to have regular exercise, to have healthy nutrition. They're interested in their health, so they go regular to check out. So, but we have a big proportion of those who don't care for health. And I think one of the groups is really, so we need to catch up is those in the age between 80 and up to 35, because this is the foundation basis for developing this more metabolic area disease. And this is where we have chances of early intervention. And therefore, I think one of the elements we can create there is a kind of self-assessment, risk 
biggest factor channels we need to promote. But in the framework, so as you said, Andrew, so um, love your liver, love your life. So it is part of the general health. And there's a group I like to focus on where we need to do extremely well um, advertising and promoting to bring them into healthcare is those who are in late stage. What about the people with uh, NASH in a fibrosis stage of um, three and plus? So those cirrhotic patients uh, who don't know that there are cirrhotic patients, what about them? Because this needs urgency and this is something we need really to address in a different way and maybe because to put NASH more in a metabolic discussion, maybe we have chances. How do you see things like that? You know, from my perspective in the metabolic discussion, you have definitely more chances for prevention. You have chances to save money on healthcare systems. To identify the cirrhotic patients, we're very close to endpoints. And I also want to see those in particular as I can do something with them. But the metabolic, identifying the metabolic patients goes more towards um, a general well-being, living healthy and these type of things. So I think that is very important. It's probably beyond what as a liver physician I can do, but I would say that's that's a key in decreasing numbers in the future. I think the other thing for me is looking at trying to find exactly the right people for a liver physician. Liver disease is growing exponentially around the world. Going to your point a little bit earlier about politicians wanting a quick win, the biggest quick win globally is liver cancer. We're not going to make the STG goals because of the rise of liver cancer around the world. So ultimately, all nations have to target finding liver cancer cancer goes back to your earlier role Joachim with liver cancer goes to a lot of the work that you guys are both doing but also also from the British perspective the British Liver Trust are doing an awful lot of work and the government's putting in targets now about finding liver cancer patients or finding those with cirrhosis who are at risk that is a big win that could be done and targeted from that perspective but it is it is finding the proportion of poor liver health that need a liver physician in the right level the right gauge and I know we talk about kilopascals being eight in a lot of the guidelines now as being where we want to refer people for a few years ago that was seven because of the numbers it's going to rise to to get to the deepest concentration quickest so we appreciate why but it doesn't mean that there's no disease at that lower level so they may still need to be looked at rather than just oh you don't make the criteria go but you want to find the endocrine health you want to find the cardiology health so it is that all-inclusive ability of the liver to be the, the the metaphor we've used recently the window to your health the window to metabolic health, the window to various, obviously, polycystic ovary disease, we could say it's a window to reproductive health, both for men and women. It's probably because it's always been stigmatised, it's always been sold in the wrong way. We really need to change that. And getting everybody together around the tables at conferences like Barcelona next week, we've obviously got Easel, we've got Arzold, Nashtag had a roundtable discussion. I think, Roger, you're leading a discussion next week with various different people, including our king. But that is the strength that I see coming now, developing and moving on in the future. That's a marvellous movement forward through all of the advocacy groups. And that's where the strength lies, I think, in the future. Louise, let me, uh, do, let me take a minute. Let me, first of all, let me run around to the other side of the table. I haven't revealed this since episode one, okay? But it's possible that my interesting fact is that my first career was in political polling. And I polled for uh, members of Congress. I polled for governors. I have a perspective that I think is maybe even a little different than Achim and Andrews and certainly different than, say, Louise's or, or yours. And the, nothing moves politicians like short-term hard numbers, right? What can you do for me next month? What can you do for me next quarter? What can you do for me next year? Prove it. And if it's not next year, it probably doesn't matter or it doesn't matter as much or it's a whole different kind of a sell. The problem I've always thought liver has, and this is previewing a little bit of how we're going to tee up Saturday's talk, is that if you want to treat cholesterol, you've got LDL levels. If you want to treat hypertension, you get CVD, even you can start with blood pressure. If you want to treat diabetes? Well, we've all settled in on glycohemoglobin. There is no number for the liver, right? Uh, and Louise, your point is a good one. You could probably could use CAP as a number if you could get enough tests to enough people and some integrated sense on how to use it. We had Naeem on the other week and you and he were significantly off on the number that you would have preferred to use, although you agreed it was because you were looking for different things. Yeah, but interestingly enough, on that point, there was a study released this week, which is a pan-European study, and Maud Lemon was the lead physician on the publication. And they did it in mono-infected HIV with fatty liver and they've come out the cap at 280 mm-hmm. with in comparison to MRI PDFF does quantify 
by moderate to severe steatosis. So we are getting more evidence now at that cutoff point. We're nearly there. So my question, Achim and Andrew, was going to be, if that's the world you live in, and of all the things you're talking about, and they're important, none of them are, here's what I can do for you next month. How do you make that tension work? Maybe I, I can start. So you know I like tactics. I, you know that I like to juggle. Um, and have different balls at the same time in the air. I have founded last year a global movement. It is the International Liver Cancer Movement, and GLI, you are part of this, and so thankful for that. And we have collected within one year more than 60 patient organizations, ASLD, APASA, ESA is part, Global Public Health 6. Using the hook of liver cancer, as you said, Louise, is something that is absolutely helpful also to addressing Nuffield Nash. So making a global movement not as an entity because you as GLI, for example, you're a strong organization. We like to support you, but bring in a global voice addressing new possibility, having liver cancer in the attention to the politicians. And then, of course, we have the discussion, okay, how to avoid. The other story is, Roger, I think we were quite successful in a very, let's say, yeah, complex health care system like in Germany. We have managed that since last year. It is mandatory that in your annual checkup, hepatitis B and C testing is mandatory. So it's the only country in the world. So you have it. So means we are able to 2030, when we have our ultimate goal to eliminate hepatitis, we can screen because of this checkup around 40 million Germans. That is a number. And that is a number that I think when we had talked 12 years before, everyone had said, you are split. You are stupid, you are naive, crazy, but we have managed. And I think one of the components here, Roger, is maybe also if you think in the policy framework, you normally think on the governmental sector, but let's shrink it down to regional sector, a city sector. So there are politicians as well, similar to what we have done in HIV, similar to what we have achieved in hepatitis C as well, is a kind of micro elimination. Make a city a liver healthy city, something like that. Because what we need to establish, and I think that is something we have it, is best practice. But best practice is particular in a center. Jörn is doing a lot of press, uh, back uh, best practice in this setting. So others is doing. But we need really to create more best practices that can be adopted to other local circumstances. And Roger, thinking about to politicians, coming back to local politicians. If I have a solution for my region here with a zero invest, but just the commitment of the politician to give his voice and say, hey, we need to align now and all the best practices is assistant can be pulled here together. Then I think we have more solutions. And that is something I think we need to think more in a clever way, not top down, but bottom up to put stress to those top line politicians, hey, on the ground, they have solutions. We can do the same. We must do the same. That is the message. And think that is something worth to think about. I would echo a lot of that. I mean, especially, obviously, our organizations are already working together on the liver cancer kind of perspective, especially underlining that. But the local side of things is critical. We have our, our liver action network that is a majority U.S., of course, with one uh, Canadian organization. But we're trying to work with them on the local legislators because that is so critical critical because they are many times community-based organizations and how can they best interact with those local offices a lot of times they're a lot more flexible you know that's the only aspect that I would add as well is that you talk about in a state or in a city uh, you know these offices are a lot more flexible in what they can do and a lot more mobile in pretend and potentially presenting opportunities for us to influence them and then the last thing I would mention too um, we have one advantage as advocacy organizations organizations that many times clinical data cannot provide to legislators. And that is, again, going to back to what we mentioned earlier, the use of story. While many times we can't highlight the numbers, because the numbers may be too far out, they may be too large for legislators to grasp or too small or whatever it might be. If you have patients or loved ones or whoever telling a story and making the situation very real for them, these congressional or, or you know parliamentary or whoever they might be offices and helping them understand the real problem, that's where you can hopefully influence in the absence of those longer term numbers. You know, going back to that, and obviously we mentioned that earlier, but still it's, it's important to 
reiterate. I, 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 I get. In fact, you're, you're reminding me of two of the rules that we used to use way back when we did this. Are stories beat data every time. And after president, the most important election is mayor. People really care about their local communities. Uh, so all that makes complete sense to me. Uh, I want to do this. We're kind of at the bottom of our hour. So let's take one more question and go around. Closing question. Andrew Rahim Louise, and your, your question and mine might be a little different. But for the three of you, given who our audience is, what's the one thing you would like them to take away that they can do that supports the work that you're doing? And then you and for us, it's what's the one thing we can do. I can start. Talk to each other. It is really the question of communication. Talk to each other. Bring all the stakeholders, all those who are interested and those who are currently not interested because they are not informed about the issue, bring them together. And I think the, the more you talk to each other and the more you break down the silos, the more success we have. It is really a question of communication, ongoing communication and passion. You know, I, it's, it's always tough to follow, Ahim. You know, I think we've been agreeing so much and saying a lot of similar stuff, but I think that was going to be really my main point too, is that if we can just have everyone talk about the liver more in general, you know, there's so many times that I've been in meetings with congressional staff. And to be honest, they can't point out where their liver is. And that is just a reality uh, that we're facing that is even beyond NASH and explaining what NASH stands for. It's that just liver in general. And that is the thing is that let's just talk, okay, liver, let's talk about it, liver health, okay, let's start thinking about that. Everyone, if we can just mention it, and I think that very much syncs up with Ahim's point as well, but just let's let's talk liver. I think I'm just going to echo what the guys have said. I think it's something that when I speak to people and they walk through the door, it's this whole thing about it has live in the title. In its name, it says live. There's a reason for that. There's also a reason it was the only organ our body we thought was so important to make it regenerate. It's that important. But... To me, and when I talk about it, make it fun. Make it something. People get empowered. If you know you can do something about it, you're empowered. There's a reason more people do health checks because they have a risk factor. When you talk about it, when we talk about liver cancer with cirrhosis, they understand that they have a risk factor of cirrhosis for liver cancer. Therefore, they don't get too anxious about their tests. It's something that they're empowered to do. So yeah, it's talk about it. Make it easy. But actually, just know about it to start with. Everything that goes you do goes through it basically <laughs> very interesting and i and i think following up with the theme of talking these days there are two ways of talking you know you can make a lot of comments on the internet social media and these things move very fast and i think they're in and out out of um, perception and i think it's important to actually sit down and uh, see people face to face and bring this forward i'll bite uh, i just learned that there is a liver emoji on, on its way emerging and i think that will be uh, of course can also be a successful factor in, in raising awareness about liver disease in and I think um, while people were talking, I was thinking of the term um, a healthy liver is a healthy body or something, uh, and, you know, linking the metabolic liver health to a healthy person. I think that'll be crucial moving forward. Yeah, so so you're, it's interesting. Your, your last tagline had something to do with where I was where I was headed, which is I talked before about stories trump data every time, but you can actually turn data into stories if you know how to do it. So you have to say, here's how the numbers connect and then make them about people and make them about real things that are, that are tangible. I think that's the first piece. And that's something this podcast can do a lot more of. And in general, the reason, well, the reason this podcast is, has been around for as long as it has and has done so well is because I think there's actually a thirst for people People think about this stuff. And we learn as time goes by that our audience broadens. We started with patients, pay, went away from patients for a while. We have more patients coming back to us now. We're getting to a place where people want to know more. And the ability for everyone who listens to this, since everyone who listens to this is in some way, shape, or form invested in fatty liver disease, to talk about it. And when your friends yawn and go, oh, gosh, that's boring. So, well, no, that's boring. And turn, turn it into a person that people know. Turn it into a story people can connect to. Help everyone realize how real, how real and how tangible this is in all of our lives. I think the thing we can do best in the two, Andrew, Achim, hats off to you folks who've done a fantastic job of talking about the way you do that. I will tell you, when we promote this episode, I'm going to stress in promotion that lots of people think that what you do isn't about them, but they're wrong. It's about everybody who's in this space, and it's vitally important. And I think you've, you've done a fantastic job. I was going to say, that may also be the reality that every single one of us sitting on the podcast and every one of us is at risk of poor liver health. 
throughout our lives at different times. So it becomes a reality that it's one of those conditions that everybody can suffer from, and that includes us. Just, and just because we know about it doesn't mean that we're not at risk of it. That's where advocacy comes in for me, and what these guys do is amazing. And anything that we can do to help support and drive people to it is absolutely key because that's where they get so much support. So hats off to Andrew and Joachim and Donna and the British Liver Trust and any of the societies around the world because that's where the real help comes in. And with that, I think we're going to jump off. I, let me first of all, uh, let me say thanks to uh, Achim and Andrew. Andrew, I realize that I live far closer to you than I do to any of these folks. And as of Friday, you will be the only one I've ever been in the same room with. So we have to fix that, obviously. I think I may be at Easel this year. So uh, that, you know, I may see a lot of you there. So there we go. Yeah. Oh, I'll get to meet you. I can't speak for Achim, but I, who I assume will be there. We all will be there. Louise, thanks. Achim, thanks. Joran, thanks. Andrew, thanks. A fantastic episode. Really interesting stuff. I'm delighted we did this. I'll be back in a couple of minutes with the business report. Everybody say goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. And now for the Season 3, Episode 23 Business Report. Slava Ukraini, Hroim Slava, glory to Ukraine, glory to heroes, and thanks again to Anna Tokar for recording our beginning for us. It's worth noting, and it's been commented to me, that as horrible and unjust as the war in Ukraine is, Ukraine is not the only country in the world where unjust wars or governments are damaging the rights of individuals. In coming weeks, we will add other statements of support as appropriate. If you have a suggestion for a country or situation to look at, please send it along to questions at surfingnash.com. I do not promise I will agree with you, but I I promise I'll take a look at it. With that, let's just dive into our announcements. By the time you listen to this, Surfing Nash will be in Barcelona for the Innovations in Naffold Care 2022 conference. This episode, like all our others, drops at 10 p.m. Eastern U.S. time on Wednesday evening. At that point, I'll be two and a half hours into my flight to Barcelona. After I arrive, I will be meeting up with a distinguished list of past and present surfers. Louise, Jorn, Stephen, and Donna Cryer will all be there. And podcast guests, including Jeff Lazarus, Naim al Khoury, Ken Cousy, Alina Allen, Zobir Yunasi, and Achim Kautz, who was on this, today's episode. We plan to conduct interviews at the conference with some of the participants and for those to be a part of the or bulk of next week's episode. So stay tuned. Look out for information on our upcoming endocrinology series. Early today, we recorded the first session of our pilot endocrinology series, the Nash Tsunami in Diabetes, Getting Ahead of a Tidal Wave. We anticipate a release date for this episode the week of May 16th or May 23rd, right after a major event on May 12th. We'll post more information on the Surfing Nash website, and we'll be making a more detailed announcement on next week's Surfing Nash episode. Look out for information on our upcoming endocrinology series. We are processing sponsorship requests for our Easel series of episodes, including the preview, beginning of week episode, two or three days of coverage, and two review episodes. We can also produce extra shows or interviews to go along with the episodes themselves. We've already signed two sponsors for parts of this series and are talking with several other interested companies. If you are interested and we've not started speaking yet, please reach out via our questions at surfingnash.com website. More buzz and lots from the vault. On the buzz front, Nash Tsunami consistency records keep breaking. This is our ninth straight week of over 1,000 downloads, our fifth out of six with over 1,200, and our third straight week with 500 or more downloads over the previous 28 days. April closes our second largest month ever with over 450 more downloads than March, and May has started strongly once again. This week's vault items continue and amplify a recent trend, people backing up recent episodes more than going way back in the pipeline. Historically, until about a month ago, 52 to 55 percent of the average week's downloads were for episodes more than a month old, but now it's been lower. This week, that number is 48 percent, and it hasn't been above 50 in the last month. Message. Tell your friends and co-workers to join us. They'll listen to one episode, they'll probably find a lot more they want to hear, and then they'll be able to go back and get it. And with that, we're done. My travel papers are complete, which is not an easy thing to do in the era of COVID. My travel list is complete. I want to thank our team, Magic Mike, Eric, Steve, Murph the Magnificent, for a typically productive week, and plus uh, setting up all the work that is going into the Getting Ahead of the Rising Tide series. This team is the best. The only thing better than the team is you folks, our listeners, you create momentum and energy, keeps us pushing into more and adventurous territory. And with Adam off, stay safe, surf on. I look forward to seeing you again next week on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website. <laughs>